Educate panelists, we have um, a, just over 1,000 participants in the Zoom room. And right now I am checking to see if the YouTube live link is working for everybody that has been sent to all staff. Just let us know when we're ready. Okay. If you'd like to feel free to begin, we have about 272 people so far logged into our YouTube live link and still just over 1,000 participants in the Zoom room. And I'll keep watching the YouTube and keeping you posted. Very good. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Anderson, Associate Superintendent. And uh, we're pleased to have you join us uh, today for a very important training and orientation to the safety and health practices that we need to follow uh, as staff during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, joining me today uh, are several panelists who uh, have been working on this plan uh, since last March, uh, getting us ready for uh, coming back to school. Uh, first is Becky Dowdy, our Director of Health Services. And Becky's been a key link to our health department and a great uh, advisor to us. Next is Clay Gehring and Clay and his team, Clay is Director of Technology Services. They've developed the Health Check app that we'll be talking to you about today that will go into effect next, next week. Sally Jo Evers is our uh, Director of Safety and Transportation. And Sally Jo has been integral to the team on working on all of the parts of the safety plan. Next is Phil Wright. Phil is our executive director for facilities. Uh, and Phil has been working with his team of custodians and maintenance staff, getting our schools ready uh, for the start of the year. And he'll talk to us about the classroom setups that we'll have when our kids uh, come back for in-person instruction. Sabra Dahl is a manager in our human resources department. And Sabra has been working with staff who are at high risk uh, on accommodations, and she'll talk about that today. Then finally, Nancy Lopez Williams is our Director of Recruitment and Retention, and, and Nancy has done a lot of the work on the training uh, videos, uh, other things that you'll see this fall for training, not only with, with other staff, but training with students when they, uh, when they come back. Uh, and uh, we're pleased to have Terry Yoki join us. Uh, Terry is uh, an interpreter for our out of hearings uh, staff, and she will be uh, interpreting during this first hour. So with that, I am going to uh, start the presentation here. Hopefully you can see that. And this is about the reopening plan that the board approved back in August. And a key component of that plan was safety and health of our staff, our students and, and our parents. Today's webinar is going to focus on safety for staff. We will be actually coming back with another webinar uh, when our students uh, are, just before our students come back to school, lots of safety practices and uh, for them. We will be going over uh, safety practices with the students and staff and families who are gonna be in the the day camp, the SPS day camps and an express. And we've been running an express program since last March, very successfully uh, with our students at uh, being located at Roosevelt and Finch Elementary. So a few instructions about uh, this webinar today. Uh, we'll do a presentation first. 
You can email questions in to us. We'll try to get to some if we get them by the end of the meeting, but we are planning to have a Q&A that'll go out to all staff after the meeting. Nancy and her team will be preparing the questions that folks have and answers to those. So you can email, you can see it right there on the screen, health and safety questions at spokaneschools.org and that'll come right to all of us panelists uh, that we can answer. And at, as I mentioned at the end of the presentation, I'll uh, kind of moderate uh, uh, asking different panelists questions you may have. So the topics we're going to cover today, probably the first one is probably uh, the talk of the town, the state, the nation is face coverings. And Becky's going to address those. We'll also share with you this daily health check that we're going to ask all staff to do starting on Tuesday. And we'll be asking all parents to do with their, uh, with their students before they come to school. We'll talk about hygiene practices today, exit and entry protocols when you're coming into a building in the district, uh, physical distancing and the room setups uh, that we are preparing for when kids come back to school. Signs of COVID, if someone has symptoms, what do we do uh, now with employees back in our buildings? Uh, what do we do? Be uh, uh, Becky will talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about training that's uh, upcoming, accommodations. And then finally, we are required by Washington state law and the Department of Health to have a COVID-19 building supervisor for every school facility. And our principals will serve that role in our school buildings. And then we have other designated staff in other uh, facilities. So with that, I introduce the panelists to you. Um, here, are our, here we are again. And so with that, I'm gonna start with Becky Audi and talk about face coverings. And I think I'll just ask these questions. They're, they're questions I've heard uh, many, many times, uh, and you probably have too, but let's start, Becky, uh, if you can unmute. Why wear face coverings to prevent the spread of COVID-19? We hear it in the national media, the state media, the local media, uh, and why, why wear a face covering? Yeah, so who knew that masks would be the topic of 2020, right? So, <laughs> um, so really, we just, we wear a face covering to reduce the amount of droplets that we talk and cough and sneeze out into the air around us. And so cloth face covering uh, reduces the amount of germs that we're spreading around to each other. And is it an effective means of stopping the spread? It, it absolutely is. Um, and research is coming out every single day that, um, that really backs this up and uh, proves to us that we really need to have those face coverings on. So um, what type of face coverings are approved for like staff who are working in public schools? So everybody should be wearing a cloth face covering um, and that is a mask um, or any, any sort of cloth face covering where you can double up the material and uh, wear it on, on your face. And so the, the one exception to this is a mask with a, an exhalation valve. Uh, those are definitely not approved, kind of defeats the purpose of covering up our, our nose and our mouth. And we're still reserving those um, surgical masks and N95 masks for healthcare workers. And so um, we're really encouraging people to, um, in the health community, we're, we're encouraging people to wear those cloth face coverings. Can I wear a bandana around my face? Um, actually, you, you can, but uh, it's much more comfortable to wear a cloth face mask. <laughs> okay. Uh, can, uh, I know the district is providing two face coverings uh, this fall for employees, but what if I just want to wear my own? Can I wear my own face covering? You absolutely can. Um, and some people will find that more comfortable than the ones that, that we provide just because they're used to wearing the ones that they own. Again, just following those guidelines, no um, valves on the mask and um, covers the entire nose and mouth area of your face. So that's how I should wear it, huh? How do I wear a face? <laughs> yeah, so the mask needs to fit snugly to your face. There should be no gapping on the sides. And um, one of my favorite things that I see when I'm out and about is people wearing it just over their mouth. 
Um, we definitely want to make sure that, that that mask is covering the mouth and the nose and that it comes down below the chin, again, snug on the sides. And, um, you know, you want to, if, if you have a mask that has the, the wire across the nose, you just want to push that down over the bridge of your nose. Also keeps your, your eyeglasses from fogging up, which I know is a common complaint um, when people wear the masks, so. And when I'm at work, where do, where do I need to wear it? So, I... <laughs> so this, is, this is a huge question, and um, I'm glad we're going to go over this today because um, there's a lot of misunderstanding around when we need to be wearing the masks at work. Um, you really need to be wearing them. You must wear them anytime you're in a building or a, in a room with other people. So even if you're in a large room, and you're 15 or 20 feet away from somebody, you're still in a room with somebody else. And so you need to be wearing your face covering. Um, if your cubicle has, uh, and I guess this would be more admin, if your cubicle has four walls and a door opening, when you're inside that cubicle, you can take your mask off. Anytime somebody comes into that cubicle with you or you leave the cubicle or anything, the mask needs to be put back on. So if you are in an office with a door like I am today, uh, the same rules would apply. Um, if I'm in here by myself, I can have my mask off, but anytime somebody comes in or I leave this room, uh, I'm gonna put my mask back on. Um, a really, really uh, very uh, hotly discussed and debated topic right now is plexiglass. Um, so I just wanna be very clear, plexiglass does not replace a face mask. The plexiglass is really to replace social distancing. It's when you can't social distance and you don't want somebody leaning over the counter to, to speak to you. So even when you're behind plexiglass, you need to be wearing your face mask. Um, that is a, that's an LNI guideline um, and health department. And so we just wanna make sure that we're keeping you safe and we don't want you to have a false sense of security when you're behind that plexiglass. We need to see you wearing a mask. Um, the exception to that, obviously, and this is a common sense thing, is when you're, you're sitting behind the plexiglass and there is nobody else in sight, you can take your, your mask down and get a breather. Um, but anytime somebody comes in, enters your area, is in the same room with you, it's the same rule, even if plexiglass is there. Um, and one more thing I just wanted to mention about the face coverings is that um, employees cannot... Um, just say that they're not going to wear a mask and come into our buildings without a mask. That is a conversation that needs to happen with HR and we need to be discussing accommodations with you if you cannot wear a mask at work. Um, so I just wanted to make sure you, you, you knew that you needed to reach out to HR if you're going to have um, any sort of uh, medical reason for not wearing a mask. Well, Long Becky, answer, Mark. <laughs> uh, Becky, I, I, I've heard the, the question, I have asthma and I can't wear a mask. So um, I cannot speak for everyone's providers and the conversations they're having with their own healthcare provider. I will say that um, we did do a lot of research this summer. We talked to national asthma foundations and reached out to our local providers who specialize in asthma care. Um, somebody who has asthma is at much higher risk of serious illness and death. And so those folks in particular um, need to be wearing a mask so that, so that we can keep you safe and we can keep you protected when you're at work. So if I'm a teacher and I'm in my classroom on a Teams meeting with my students and my door is closed, can I take my mask off? Yes. If you are alone in a room, it, 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 you can take that mask off. Anybody comes into that room, mask on. So um, I noticed in the video training that, that uh, we sent out about caring for your mask, the lady there said I'm supposed to wash it every day on hot water and put it in a hot dryer. Is that accurate? So we do want you to wash those masks every day, um, but we ask that you allow them to air dry. And right now when the weather is nice, let them dry out in the sun. Um, we want to we want to make those masks last as long as possible. So um, being in the dryer every single day is going to wear them out more quickly and it is okay to dry them in the sun or just just hanging out to dry. So I do know this summer we uh, had to almost talk the Department of Health into face shields uh, mm -hmm. so that our teachers could uh, teach and the students, especially younger students, could see 
facial expressions and a mouth for pronouncing words or even a high school's you know Spanish teacher tell us about face shields can I when, when can I wear a, a face shield if I'm a teacher and how should it be worn and what about masks and face shields what's the answers to those well, you're right. This was a very robust conversation over the summer, um, and there is some confusion, and I, I completely understand that. And the confusion, um, some of it, is coming from the fact that OSPI guidelines do say that a student can opt to wear a face shield rather than a mask. That does not apply to staff. So we were able to work with the health department and um, make it so that our instructional staff can wear a face shield when they are at the front of the classroom providing instruction. And that is so the students can see your mouth, see your facial expressions. But when you come away from that um, instructional space from the front of the classroom, you need to put your mask back on. I mean, you can certainly be extra safe and wear the mask with the face shield. You don't have to take your face shield off when you have stopped teaching. Um, but we do we do require a mask if you are not at the front of the classroom teaching. Um, other staff that would be wearing a face shield would be the nursing staff when they are in the health room and they're assessing students who may be sick. Um, another another thing that I really want to emphasize um, is that you cannot exchange a face shield for a mask. And what I mean by that is, is if you're not comfortable wearing a mask, a face shield is not an acceptable um, substitute. So um, when we see you walking around um, the district, then uh, we want to see you wearing those, those cloth face coverings. A face shield is, is, not, is not a substitute for that. Again, if you need an accommodation, that's a conversation that happens with HR. And um, we're happy to work with you and find um, a way that we can, we can make you safe. Um, so yeah, the, it, again, it's it's. Uh, I think it's more comfortable for people to wear that face shield, but we are requiring a face a cloth face covering when you're not at the front of the classroom teaching. So we may have parents and students uh, coming back into our schools next week for parent teacher lunch conferences. Uh, um, what if parents come into the school and they don't have a mask on? So all of our district buildings have a supply of disposable surgical masks by the front door. Um, and of course, we do require that anybody entering our building be wearing a face covering. And so if they do not have those, we would provide one for them. Very good. And then the last one is, uh, what if I <laughs> see one of my colleagues not wearing their face covering? What do I do? <laughs> Well, you're going to tell on them, of course, but so this uh, this will this will feed into the conversation around a COVID supervisor in each building. Um, and so this is something that if you do see this and um, you may, you are going to want to report this to your um, your building administrator and or the COVID supervisor, whoever is acting in that role. Um, and that's not a conversation you need to have yourself. So um, we will turn that over to the building administrators to have those conversations. Well, thank you, uh, Becky. This was uh, good information. I know this is probably the hottest topic across the country and now in our school district. Um, the second thing that we were talking a lot about this summer was the requirement that everyone gets checked before they come into the building to say whether or not they've had some symptoms of COVID. Can you talk to us about that, what are the symptoms, and then what we finally came up with? <laughs> so, I mean, as anybody knows who's following the news, the, the list is long of potential COVID symptoms, um, but, but we do have a, a list that we have been asked to um, check on, and that is from, that's coming from Department of Health, OSPI reiterated that in their guidelines, and so the list that you see here on this slide is, is what we're looking for. Um, one thing that OSPI absolutely was um, firm about was that we check temperatures of people before they enter the building. <clears throat> and so this makes sense, but um, in all of our work this summer with uh, the amazing team of people who were brainstorming how to get this done, uh, we quickly realized that doing this manually at the door, um, and when I say that, I mean checking the student's temperature and then asking them the list of um, COVID-related health questions, uh, in a large building, we were looking at three to four hours just to get the kids into the building safely. And so OSPI also gave us the option um, of 
doing a, what is called an attestation at home, and we're calling it a health check because nobody likes that word attestation. So, um, but this is going to reduce the the amount of pressure at the door in the buildings, uh, getting students in a little bit more quickly and efficiently, and still making sure that um, we have we have done due diligence and we have we've checked them for any COVID symptoms. And so we worked with uh, Clay and his team, and they did a fabulous job of creating a program for us that we can log on and we can provide that information before we even leave our homes. And so uh, Clay is going to talk about that today and show you what we what he's done. Here is the Health Tech app and Clay will talk about instructions and actually I think later today in your all staff communication you'll get a couple little video tips too on how to use this app. But go ahead Clay. Yeah, so the Health Check app, uh, the app is kind of a, a almost a bad word for this because it's not, when, when you think about your smartphone, you think of an app as you go to the app store and download it. This is not an app in the sense you're going to download it. We'll show you in a bit a short video or we'll show you where you can find a short video to simply just put the link to the website on your phone. You click on it every day, it'll just be right there on your on your phone. You don't have to navigate to that, that website. Obviously, you'll sign in. Mark will take us through this. Um, Go ahead and click on that mark. I think we can uh, we can do that quick, and maybe we'll come back to this slide. So as you can see here, obviously you'll sign in with your username and password. Scroll down just a little bit, Mark, so you can see that part at the bottom. Um, it talks about adding this staff shortcut to your phone. If you have an Android phone or an iPhone, there's two 15-second videos for whatever platform you're on that'll show you how to add the shortcut um, to this URL to your phone, so you don't have to go to that um, website every single time. So just a quick icon. So Mark, go ahead and sign on there. Um, and this will present to you the list of, of same symptoms that we saw in that prior slide, um, basically just reviewing those. Um, and, and one thing we noted there is if you have any current uh, of the above symptoms, not related to chronic health conditions like seasonal allergies. So we're trying to, and, and Becky may speak to that. It's trying to be understanding that people sometimes have things that just come seasonally there's a series of questions here, whether you're gonna be working on site today. Um, that's the ones we're more concerned about, obviously. If you have any of those symptoms present, you would answer yes. So um, have you been in close contact with anyone or suspected of, of confirmed COVID? And then have you taken any medication to control a, a fever um, before coming to work? So, and then scroll down one more thing that's kind of important here that we'll go back when we talk, look at the slide here, is we are asking each staff member to scan their badge um, when they're entering the building. And it doesn't mean that you have to have let the door close and then scan it and then close the door behind you so the person behind you has to rebadge. If the door is open, you can still badge in. As long as you hear the beep, it'll badge you in. And that way we know who's in the building. Um, then we can know that they've completed the uh, health check. And that also helps for later on, if we, ever, if we do have some kind of a, a need to do contact tracing, we know who's been in the building so we can contact them. So badging, uh, hitting that uh, badge reader when you enter the building is, is really important. Uh, go ahead and hit submit on that, Mark. And that's all there is to it. Go to the website, sign in, check your symptoms, answer the questions, hit submit. Um, 20, 30 seconds, um, and you're in. So, um, so as we noted there on the note, each badge of staff member is asked to swipe their badge. Um, go back one more thing, Mark. I just want to make sure they know that. So there is a report that goes to their administrators. So administrators can check the report very quickly. We'll be training them tomorrow as to um, what, uh, uh, as to how to see the daily health check report. So they'll be able to tell who has and has not completed it. So if you haven't completed it, you may find you're, uh, you're being contacted to complete that every day uh, before you arrive. Um, and then there's an email address to send questions to health check help at spokaneschools.org if you have questions about the app and how that works. I know Becky is okay with you contacting her in terms of symptoms and things and trying to understand those. So um, pretty Very straightforward, good. Yeah. keep it simple. Again, this is for the staff portion of the health check. We have developed also a companion uh, platform for staff, for, for parents to do the uh, health check for their students. Um, we're not gonna go into that today. That'll come later as we get closer to having lots of students in the building. So Becky, uh, uh, so we're not going to actually take students and staff's temperature at the door. We're asking them to attest they took their own temperature and it's below 100.4? 
So yes and no. Um, just because if uh, if a student comes to the door and staff would be a, a different thing that will be handled by whoever the COVID supervisor is in the building or the building administrator. But with students, if they show up at our door and they have not completed this health check or their parent has not completed it, then we would manually screen them at the door. We'd take a quick temp and make sure that they were um, they were okay to enter the building. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on, and I see a lot of questions coming in about this, and I think it's worth mentioning now, is that we, of course, are, um, we live in reality and we understand that um, we may not always get accurate reporting from families at home. Um, and I just, I would like to say that we, we will, even if we checked them at the door and they had received Tylenol at home to get rid of that fever that they've had for a couple of days, um, we're still, it's still going to be the same thing. We're going to bring them to the health room as soon as we do know, notice that they have any symptoms and we're going to assess them and we're going to send them home. So um, this is really the best option is for us to be able to take some of that pressure off of the front doors, knowing it's not going to be perfect or foolproof, um, but all of the nursing staff will be uh, really monitoring the kids and um, we'll do our best to, to get those kiddos home that slipped through the, in the morning with, with, the, with the attestation app. So, and as uh, we said earlier, we are gonna be coming back with another webinar when it's closer to the time for our in-person instruction and we'll cover this again then. Uh, but we certainly want employees to understand that uh, we will be doing this health check, all of us, before we come to work uh, each day, we'll be badging in. And Becky, what happens if uh, I forget and I'm in the building and my principal gets a report that I'm here in the building and I don't see a record that I got my health check done at home? Well, if you're here at admin, you're going to get a visit from me and my thermometer. So nobody wants that. Um, but out in the building, uh, the building administrator will be monitoring this and we will track you down and we will um, help you take your temperature and complete that health check. Uh, and it's going to take some time for us to all get used to this and certainly for families to get used to this. And so we're going to be providing a lot of, of information and assistance so that uh, we can eventually achieve success doing this. Very good. Well, probably the, besides uh, face masks, the other big talk around is hygiene practices. And Sally Jo uh, Evers, our uh, Director of Safety and Transportation. Mm -hmm. Sally Jo, uh, talk to us about good hygiene practices. Sure thing. So besides the face covering, one of the best things that we can do is wash our hands frequently. And of course, you know, we, we do the, we wash our hands many times a day beginning of the day, before lunch, after lunch, before the end of day. Um, big thing though to remember is that we, we want you to wash your hands after touching those high touch surfaces, um, just to make sure that you reduce any chance of, of spreading anything or, or, or picking up any germs on your hands. And the key also is to wash your hands for 20 seconds and with soap and water. And in the absence of that, there is hand sanitizer in the buildings. And so we're, we're, we're spreading that out to make that available to staff. Um, we have also, there are disposable gloves, but I, after speaking with Becky, we've, we've talked about the gloves are only needed for the same tasks that you've been using them for um, on a normal basis. And so that's where the gloves come in. And, uh, we also talk about disinfecting those surfaces that we commonly touch or that we commonly use. And so in your classroom, you know, you, you might just want to be extra cautious about wiping down surfaces uh, on a daily basis. And there will be products available for you um, throughout the facilities. So, and again, as we said, there'll be more training offered for disinfecting classrooms when students return. And we'll, we'll also have more education for families and students as well. But like I said, one of the best things you can do besides that face covering is to wash your hands frequently and very thoroughly. So when we talk about thoroughly, it's between the fingers, up the wrist, the back and the front of the hand, 
And I'm sure people have said that there are several little songs that you can sing when you wash your hands, but Happy Birthday or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star works perfect. So that's just a good rule of thumb. Anything else, Mark? Uh, what What's this cleaning caddy? What's that? So we've put those, they will, the, they will be distributed and they may already be located in some of the buildings, but they will have disinfectant spray um, located in them so that you can wipe down spray and wipe down surfaces that you are commonly in, like your classrooms. Um, and then they will be, those same materials will be used in the common areas. Very good. So what about, um... Talking about employees now, but later we will talk about students coming in and out of the buildings. But what about employees? What's, what's, what protocol should we follow if we're coming into a building or if we're leaving a building? Perfect. So we want to make sure that everybody completes the health check before coming to the facility. Um, and then also wear that face covering as you're nearing an entrance, just in case there are multiple employees that are preparing to go inside. So just have that face covering available and on. Um, and as Clay has said before, we would like everybody to scan their ID badge on the reader when you enter. And so regardless of the position of the door, you can scan your badge. And once you hear that beep, you know that it's been um, entered into the system. And that will help us with contact tracing. So if everybody could please remember to do that, that would be great. Um, and then again, we've spoken about washing your hands frequently and thoroughly. Remember the 20 seconds and to wear your mask in any common area. That's super important because even if you look down a long hallway and you see someone, you don't see anyone in the hallway, someone could step into that space at any time. So we want to protect you and, and those who are also in the building. And then we have discussed there may be designated doors for staff. So you would want to check with your building administrator. Uh, the reason for designating doors for staff entry and exit is that if we have multiple programs in the building, we may need to avoid cross-contamination with those, with those um, programs. And so just check to make sure that there isn't a specific door that you need to enter or exit. Very good. Wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. Oh yes, please. And then also wear your mask until you're safely in your vehicle. And then I always keep hand sanitizer, you know, there in the door. And um, so once you're in your vehicle safely, you remove your mask and then I disinfect your hands with your hand sanitizer. And hand sanitizer is, the, is an acceptable replacement when you cannot wash your hands with soap and water. Um, and it needs to have just, um, the 60% alcohol-based for it to be effective. Well, thank you, Sally Jo. Uh, another uh, discussion, and we've seen it when we're out in supermarkets or stores, uh, is the whole idea of social distancing uh, and staying apart. And uh, uh, Phil Wright and his team at facilities have been working to prepare our schools and facilities uh, for social distancing. And I'd ask Phil to talk about the items that we've put in place and what's also coming. Sure. So as uh, staff and community are uh, arriving at our schools, the first thing they're probably gonna notice is we're gonna have some signs out front at the drop-off areas and at the approaches to buildings, which will say, uh, keep moving and don't gather. That's kind of our first step in encouraging the social distancing. As you approach the building, uh, there's actually going to be signs at each of the entry points as well, which starts to reinforce this, please stay six feet apart. And as you enter the building, you're going to start to see some six inch vinyl dots on the floors in some of those critical areas where we anticipate that folks would be gathering. One of the prime areas is, of course, the main office. You're going to find a social distancing dot at the transaction desk, the main desk, and we encourage staff and community to use that dot. Um, one of the issues that we're seeing pop up at the sites is folks wanting to poke their head around the 
the plexiglass barrier. So by by using those social distancing dots, it's kind of guiding people in the safe safest location to stand for everyone's everyone's uh, benefit. Um, also, you're as you walk through the school, you're going to see these out in front of restrooms. You're going to see them in the lobby areas in front of the elevators. You'll see them in the elevators. So these are intended to reinforce that social distancing expectation anywhere where we anticipate that there could be some gathering. Um, it's not going to be this exactly the same for every school. Um, every school operates a little bit differently and the principals and custodial staff have worked together to identify where those key areas in are. In the secondary schools, of course, the lunch lines are going to be a very prominent location for these. And you're gonna see a lot of dots, uh, the six inch dots in those areas. I also wanted to discern between two inch dots and I'll talk about that in just a little bit when we talk about the classroom setups, but you're also gonna see two inch dots out there. Those are not the social distancing dots. Those are used to locate furnishings um, and, and color code seats and things of that nature. So, and then of so course- Phil, we, we've, we've been talking about setting up classrooms uh, and why, why just kindergarten through fourth grade classrooms do we have to make desks so they're six feet apart tell us about that and why why not k through 12 or etc this whole talk about classroom setups and six foot distancing and who came up with this rule <laughs> <laughs> well it, it is a, a rule of the it's the guidelines of ospi is set out to us as well as spokane regional health all classrooms need to be spaced at a six foot social distancing when the students are seated. Now we know that there's gonna be um, transient interaction that happens between students if they were to get up or cross um, past another student's desk, but this requirement is intended for their seating position so that their exposure level during the um, class time is maintaining that six foot social distancing. So um, at the classroom uh, areas, um, We've got a staggered setup for typically for a 21 student seating um, arrangement. And over the summer, we've actually gone in with a crew, a, a setup team, and they've done three classrooms in every school um, to try to provide a reference point for everyone within the school to see how these setups can be performed. That doesn't mean that every classroom can achieve a 21 uh, seat setup. Um, we know there's smaller classrooms out there that simply won't be able to achieve that. And that's okay. We've already included that into the modeling for trying to get as many um, K through four students back to the classroom. So at the five, six and uh, secondary level, um, the, the students will of course be returning at a half occupancy. So all these rooms will be, have half the, half the students that they normally would have had. So what we're going to do in those rooms is oftentimes we can leave the seating arrangement alone but identify the seats with a red or a blue dot and so when half the students are there they will sit at either the red or the blue seat and that will help maintain that six foot social distancing even though the desks may be closer together at any single time students will still be seated at alternating desks on either a red or a blue dot and be able to maintain that social distance so these are a couple examples, um, some of our better examples that we've done during our mock-ups. Uh, the one up above there is Mullen Road, room 135. And you can see that in this room, we had to use a combination of both tables and desks to achieve the density. So we often can't do this with the same furnishings that are in the room because the two by four tables, of course, are larger and they start to expand the, the footprint in the area required for the room. So in this situation, we have a mix of seven student desks with 14 tables to achieve it. A couple of other things to note here, you can see that in the middle of the picture, there's a bookcase that we were able to actually put right back into the arrangement. And this is one way that we can try to keep some more of the furnishings in the classroom. Our, our intent has been to preserve as many of the furnishings in these classrooms as possible, but the, the reality is, is that um, in many cases, we need that entire floor area to get the 21 seat capacity that we need. And, and what then, about the, what about the, you said there's some small dots or something that goes in a room or? Yeah, thank you. So the two inch vinyl dots you're gonna see in the schools to locate desks on hard floors. 
and you're going to see two inch Velcro patches used to locate the desks on carpeted surfaces. And so the intent of these markers is so that these rooms can be quickly reset in case we have desks that tend to migrate, you know, throughout the school day or if custodians need to move furnishings to uh, do cleaning or whatnot. Um, so this enables us to reset that room very quickly without having to do remeasuring. Um, and, and so actually going down to our example here at the secondary level, you can see the red dot blue dot arrangement. So in this particular case, we had a, a, a room that had standard capacity, probably 30 students or, or so. And um, instead of having to remove some of those desks, we were simply able to keep this standard arrangement and label the desk red dot, blue dot, and just make sure that our students are sitting in, uh, not sitting in red and blue at the same time. And that helps maintain the social distance thing. And it also increases the um, time or decreases the frequency of disinfection that's needed since uh, we can go through two class periods without having a student sit in the same seat. So if I come into class at uh, Lewis and Clark High School, and it's second period when we're back into uh, in school. Uh, I'm the teacher. What do I tell students to do? And I say, you're the red dot group. <laughs> yeah, as they're entering this, the teachers are going to have to kind of develop a protocol for this. And it doesn't matter which way they go, but they're just going to have to establish a pattern for identifying which seat the students will be in. And of course, we are asking the teaching staff after that second period, after the red dot and the blue dot's been um, sat in, that we will be disinfecting those table surfaces to make sure that they're ready for the next uh, third period that would come in. So Phil, you know, uh, we're currently uh, uh, in Spokane, not at a place uh, recommended by the Department of Health that we have um, back to in-person learning with most of our students. So why are you trying to set up kindergarten through fourth grade classrooms now? Why not just wait till we Get, got the green light to come back. Well, knowing that we're going to have some, possibly some small groups in these classrooms, um, we still need to be able to maintain that social distancing now. So we do need to make sure some setup goes on. But the real problem for us is that knowing that these classrooms to set them up properly are going to need a blend of furnishings, we really need to start this process of identifying what their furniture needs are, because we're probably going to be pulling furniture from across the district to supplement those rooms that need extra furniture. So Old Jefferson is gonna become probably a, uh, a warehouse uh, for us that we can pull furnishings from. And we've got others at the Art Nevada Street Warehouse and other sources, but this is going to take several weeks for us to get through this process. And we wanna make sure that we are ready to go and work that facilities is not going to be the holdup when we get that call that Spokane Regional Health is allowing us to enter, um, bring students back. Um, it's going to be important that the classrooms are ready to go because if we wait until we get that call, it's going to be several weeks before we can even th think about getting students back into the building. And that's the last thing that we want. So, uh, Phil, I'm a teacher and I'm kind of picky about how my classrooms arranged. Can Do I get to be there or help out in arranging it with your team of custodians and maintenance staff? Yeah, that's a good question. So, Teaching staff, you should have on your classroom door right now a classroom setup sign. It's a yellow sheet that's taped to your door. And what we've asked you to do by September 4th is to basically give us some guidance, uh, indicate whether that room is ready to be set up and whether you're removed extra furnishings from that room. And also to tell us when you would like to participate, if you would like to participate in the room setup. And what we'll do is we'll make sure that our custodial staff works with you when you're doing that. And so we're seeing a, a difference in how different teachers want to approach this. Some want a full setup by the custodial staff. Some would prefer have being very closely involved in it and just getting a little bit of guidance from the custodians at the building. So either approach is fine. Um, what the goal is is to make sure that we are achieving a setup that works for the teacher and achieves that six foot social distancing and gets the room capacity um, where we need it. Very good, thanks, Phil. Um, so we have uh, staff back in buildings now, uh, working, getting ready for school, thank you. Um, but Becky, back to you. What if uh, some staff member currently might be showing some signs that they have symptoms of COVID? What, what do we do? 
Uh, so um, great question. And it's a question I know that I'm getting a lot. And just looking at some of the, the chat questions, I, I want to say that there is so much information and, and we have so many details here. Please do feel free to email me if you have questions that are not being answered here today. Um, really, we can only highlight some of these things. But if someone uh, becomes sick at work, which happens, um, what we need them to do is to isolate themselves. I mean, obviously, if you start feeling sick, please move away from other people. Um, we want you to notify your supervisor that you are sick and we want you to go home right away. Um, so no more, no more of those days where we all stay at work, even though we start feeling kind of bad during the day. Uh, you need to go home um, and you need to call your provider and ask for directions um, whether or not they feel you need to be tested. Uh, they will assess you and tell you what you need to do next. And so um, Phil and his team will obviously work in those areas where somebody was working who was sick and um, as they have been doing, and they will make sure that those, um, those areas are disinfected very well. And the next thing that I would uh, ask is that the supervisors, any, anyone who's supervising people, if, if your employee tells you that they, they start feeling sick at work and they are having some of these symptoms, um, please report that information to me. Uh, that that kind of starts a, a, a chain reaction of um, giving me the chance and, and my staff the chance of working with these people and um, starting the process of contact tracing. Uh, and so I want to let everybody know that it's it's mandatory for you to let your supervisor know if you are being tested for COVID or you have, you've tested positive for COVID. And we will absolutely keep that information private. Um, we, we don't want anybody putting their COVID status on uh, social media because that really starts conversation amongst your, your colleagues and it creates a lot of fear. And so we would ask that you would keep your, also keep your own health information private. Um, our main priority is really just to keep us all safe and healthy and uh, we do have a small team, including myself, of uh, contact tracers who are working internally. Um, so we will be working with the health department, but we can provide another um, level of service to the district by uh, doing that contact tracing internally with nursing staff. Um, so our, our number one goal is if you are uh, you are sick or you've been tested, you have to be home because of an exposure or, or a positive test for COVID, um, we will call you and, and it might be me that calls you and we're just going to ask you some basic questions and, and be patient with us when we do that. Uh, the questions they will, we will ask you are all, they should all just be based around um, your time at work. So we just want to know when you were at work last, um, when you tested positive for COVID or or when you got tested for COVID. Um, and we just wanna be able to work with the people you may have had contact with at work. And so those questions will be very basic. We will not be asking you invasive health questions. Um, we just, we just wanna create a picture of who we need to talk to in our district buildings who may have been exposed to the virus. And by doing that, we, we really want to provide that wraparound service with you and connect you to the larger team here at the district as well. Um, HR can talk to you about leave options and nursing staff can support you um, as you are home and you're feeling awful. And so, um, so please just know that you might hear from us. Um, so please let's keep that line of communication open. Um, there is absolutely no stigma around uh, being tested or getting sick with COVID. Um, and, and we do want to support you. And so I, I just, if, you know, if we work together and we do communicate with each other, we're going to have a better chance of uh, staying well and also keeping our buildings open once we get open. So um, that is our goal. Then uh, um, if I am confirmed a case of COVID, which there's been hundreds here in Spokane County, mm -hmm. uh, how long do I have to Stay home. So we are very closely following uh, Spokane Regional Health District's guidance around um, quarantine and uh, amount of time um, that you need to stay out of work after you have been sick. And so um, we do have those guidelines 
deadlines they are in our um, our reopening plan that has been put out. And so if you have any questions about that, about exact timelines, um, send me an email and I'm happy to discuss this with you. And wanna thank uh, Terry for her interpreting. And now we have uh, Jack uh, Orit who's uh, interpreting for us now. So thank you and welcome Jack. Okay, well, this is um, good information, but is this, the only training I'm going to get on uh, uh, COVID and working in the buildings. And uh, with that, I'm going to ask Nancy Lopez Williams to cover a training opportunity. Okay, good morning. So we, uh, my team, including Brian Murray, um, have really approached this as a, a three-tier training um, series. And so um, first and foremost, we really want to ensure that we're providing all of the necessary information that you need in order to do the amazing work with kids. And so um, I'm just going to walk through the different tiers. Um, currently, we are really, um, we have provided training that is specific to elementary and with through an elementary lens. Um, however, the adult obviously is um, more geared for the adults. Uh, secondary videos are, are coming very shortly. So uh, specifically for level one training, uh, for staff, we have safe start training that we hope that you have um, seen communication around um, through our weekly updates uh, through the communications department. Um, but if you go to our staff homepage, you will see the safe start training videos. Uh, on that staff homepage at the very bottom under headlines is the Safe Start COVID training videos that cover these topics. Coronavirus awareness, the do's and don'ts of wearing masks and gloves, proper hand washing and social distancing. These trainings take about 20 minutes. And then we go into level two training, which is um, what we're doing today by um, participating in this district-wide webinar. And we will have future webinars as we get ready for students to um, start coming into the buildings. So um, as I'm watching your, uh, your questions in the chat box, I can tell that you're very, um, you're very uh, diligent about asking great questions about what happens when I have students in my classroom. Um, are we going to get more information? And yes, um, we do plan on updating and providing more information as needed as we get students back into the building. And our level three training is really department specific. And so um, our nutrition services staff and our custodial staff have been working with their employees to make sure that they have the training that best meets their needs. And then you mentioned, uh, Nancy, some training videos. Uh, tell us about those and who are they for? Okay, so those um, COVID training videos um, that I just spoke to um, are for staff. Um, these ones that you see in front of you, the COVID-19 training videos are, there's one for staff and that's re regarding the health check that Clay spoke to. And then there's also one that's, uh, that's uh, a training video for families as they are um, going through that health screening app. I have seen that many of you are asking regarding uh, those families that are opted for an in-person conference for next week. And so um, uh, I will make sure that those videos get um, shared out through a multiple um, through multiple areas. So that way our families have what they need um, in order to be able to do those health screenings. Um, so and then we, go ahead. So I do understand, Nancy, that because we're we're kind of in this period of first we're getting staff to use the Health Check app, and then we'll get families to use it with kids. What we have done for next week, and it should arrive at schools by tomorrow, we've created a big, large sign to go right outside the front door that has all the symptoms that Becky talked about. And basically, it's asking parents and students to if they're coming for a conference to say, have you had any of these symptoms? Have you had a fever over 100.4? And if you have, turn around and go home and call the office, don't come in. So that's kind of our, our, our crutch to get by uh, next week. But then we will uh, start training and sending out the video as well as training instructions to all those families whose students are going to be um, in the SPS day camps or express. 
programs so that they do it daily before they come to day camp. We're also going to be sending it out to families uh, of special needs students and ELD students who are going to be regularly coming in in small groups for in-person instruction. So those two groups we will start early on uh, and then certainly we'll get everybody oriented, families oriented before we start in-person instruction. We also have videos regarding physical distancing, hygiene practices, and face coverings. And um, like I said before, we are working uh, with Ryan Lancaster on developing um, videos that cover these same areas for our secondary students. Very good. So uh, we've heard lots about uh, people who have health risks and Sabra Dahl in our uh, human resources department has been working with a variety of agencies, as well as our own local health department and our own HR specialist on what, what do we do? What if I'm a, an employee that's over 65 or uh, have some health conditions? So Sabra, what, what do employees do? Yeah, so we have a really great team in our leave and accommodation specialists that have been helping with many of these conversations and, and really just in terms of a high level overview, accommodations are part of the American with Disabilities Civil Rights Act, which prohibits any employer or just really any discrimination with individuals who are experiencing disabilities in all public life. And the whole purpose of this act is really for employers and employees to engage in an interactive dialogue related to um, accommodations or adjustments in their um, you know, work site or um, other you know, types of accommodations that would allow them to perform the essential functions of their job efficiently and productively. And with COVID, the governor, our Governor Inslee has issued a proclamation that was recently renewed that um, allows those individuals in high risk categories. And that would be defined in the proclamation as those employees who are over the age of 65 or who may be experiencing an underlying health condition that falls within the CDC definition of at increased risk. And that might include somebody who has like an immune compromised state or maybe currently being um, you know, going through cancer treatments and some other health conditions, it allows those employees to just self-attest. And when that occurs, then we engage in an, this interactive dialogue to determine what a reasonable accommodation might look like to ensure that they stay health and healthy and safe. Um, for other employees, we go through the normal and typical ADA process in which we get some information from healthcare providers and we work on what an accommodation might be to allow that employee who might be experiencing restrictions associated with their personal medical condition to continue working. Um, so we always first try and accommodate in the position and that might be an adjustment to the work site or work schedule or some other you know, modification, and then we'll look at alternative work assignments, um, which might include an element of remote work. Um, and of course, if there's not an ability to accommodate um, either through the work site or an alternative work assignment, we may be exploring leave options with that employee, just depending on what that looks like. So employees can request an accommodation at any time by contacting human resources. Um, there's also a tremendous amount of leave and accommodation information that's available right on the human resources page. If employees go through the staff um, portion of the district website and navigate through the departments to human resources, there's an leave and accommodation link where there's a lot of information regarding um, use of leave options and COVID specific resources. Um, a lot so, of Go ahead, Mark. Saber, if I come down with the sniffles and I don't feel like coming to work, what kind of leave do I use? Yeah, so employees receive um, leave accruals every year if they're feeling unwell and they 
are unable to work, they should be submitting and using their regular sick leave. So that would be no different in the COVID environment. And even with remote work, if you're unable to complete your work, you would notify your supervisor and timekeeper that you're unwell and you're accessing sick leave. And our sub team has been working really diligently to have subs ready in this new environment to support those needs. Very good. So the next area is, uh, and you heard us talk about it at the beginning, is the requirement for every school and every building in the district to have a COVID-19 building supervisor. At schools, that'll be your school principal. Uh, here at the district office, uh, it's Cindy Coleman. Uh, at facilities, it's Phil Wright. And out at ITSC, it is Greg Trepas. And the responsibilities of the supervisor is to uh, monitor the health of employees and students and enforce our safety plan that um, got approved by the Department of Health and OSBI, which is wearing masks while in facilities. And as Becky said, if folks aren't wearing masks, uh, you should be telling your building supervisor who will address that with uh, the employee or the student. Uh, the physical distancing, uh, hygiene practices, uh, cleaning and disinfection protocols. What happens if a student or a staff member has signs of COVID? The, the building supervisor will be responsible, responsible for um, isolating the student, for example, uh, getting a hold of their parents, having them sent home, uh, contacting Becky immediately, uh, Dowdy in nutrition service or in health services to do uh, that contact tracing that we talked about, et cetera. So very important role. Uh, and uh, our building principles are certainly up to, to, to dealing with that. So with that, we've had lots of questions uh, in the chat, and I'm gonna stop sharing here, and I'm gonna go to uh, some of the questions, and uh, I'll ask our panel of experts to uh, respond. And the first one has to do with back to the Health Check app. Uh, Becky and Clay, um, I'm a itinerant music teacher and I go between three or four buildings uh, in a day. Uh, will each building know that I've completed my health check app? Who, who knows that I've done it and, and what, what happens there? As long as you have completed the health check. Um, so the notification that goes to administrators is really about who has not completed the health check. So as long as you've completed it, they will know you have you have done you've done that. So um, if you make sure you complete it, you're good. You're, there will be a primary supervisor for your account, um, and that's who will see if you have not, and they would be in touch with you. Uh, again, as long as you complete it, you'll drop off the list because they're we're really only notifying them about people who have not completed it. And when we come back to uh, to in-person instruction and students. Uh, and families will be doing this health check app. Are they supposed to do it before the kid gets on the bus? Yes, yes, they are. Um, okay. Because once they once they get on the bus and they come to us, they'll still be checked in line or at the door. And um, if their name is showing up, then those students are going to have to be screened manually. And questions about uh, substitute staff. Uh, are they going to have to do the health check app and do they have to scan into a school if I'm, if I'm doing in-person instruction and I'm filling in for a teacher that's on leave? How does that work? Subs do have uh, sign-on accounts as long as they have a district username and password, they would, they would need to and be able to complete the health check app. Uh, badging in is a question that was asked. We're going to have to kind of talk about that right now. I don't think subs, all the subs have badges. So we'll have to kind of explore that uh, a little further in terms of what we do for, for those individuals, but they certainly, they definitely complete the health checkout. And how, how about student teachers? Yes, they have student, they have, they have user accounts as well. Same, same protocol. And uh, Becky, it talks about part of your, your health check at a station, it says, have you had a temperature over 100.4? Do I have to take my temperature every day at home? Yes, yes, you do. Um, and, and, you know, we do know that 
that thermometers are, um, you know, we know that they can be expensive, but really if you're only using it for yourself, uh, a $10 uh, Walgreens oral thermometer will work just fine. Um, we are recommending if possible to use a non-touch thermometer, especially if you're living in a house with other people because you don't want to share these germs, but um, yep, it's required every single day. So I'm a uh, parent and I come to school and I, I'm, I did the health check app for my, my student who's at school, but I need to come in and uh, I'm going to volunteer, let's say, in the classroom. And I, there is no health check app for me. What, what does a parent do when they come to school? So anybody that comes into our buildings, I'm just kind of touching on what Sally Joe said uh, before, anybody who comes into our buildings will come through that single point of entry and they will be checked then with the thermometer and the questions. Very good. Let's see, other questions here that are common, kind of common. So um, we don't have students in schools yet, but uh, Phil, this is a question. Um, when, when we do have students back in schools, uh, who's going to wipe down the desk and who's going to wipe down the elevator buttons and the doorknobs and so forth? Who, who's responsible? Who's doing what? It's just, I know it's going to take a team effort. Yeah, absolutely. So our custodial staff has adapted to a high touch um, disinfection program throughout the day. Um, and that's going to continue when students return. Uh, they, they are doing that in the buildings now. Um, as far as classrooms go, our guidelines include that teaching staff at the elementary school will be disinfecting those desks once per day. Um, there's a little bit less risk at the elementary level as far as cross desk um, contamination since the students sit in the same desk. But at the secondary level, similarly, teachers will need to disinfect between every other period, similar to that discussion about the red dot, blue dot desks. So it is a combination of forces. Custodial staff will do all the common areas, uh, but as far as the desk surfaces in the classroom, we're asking teacher, teachers to uh, help out with that. And uh, Phil, another question. I know that you and your teams will be working with, are working in kindergarten through fourth grade classrooms, setting them up uh, six feet apart. Uh, there's been a common question about they've seen it maybe on a picture or so forth. There's one desk that's like right next to the sink. How's that being handled? So most of the layouts, even though those desks look like they're right on the sink, there's actually a space there. Um, again, we do recognize that students may have some very short time during which they're closer than six feet apart. That's why we're wearing the masks. That's why we have the other precautions in place. Um, if it is truly a, an arrangement where the sink is absolutely needed and the desk is preventing access to that sink, it is possible that we could remove that desk from the classroom. That's not what we're finding as we're doing these setups. We're finding that there typically is enough space so that sink can be used um, at the same time. I know some of the images are a little bit misleading, but if you have any questions as you're going through this process, don't hesitate to reach out to me or someone on my team and we'll come out and take a look and uh, help you through that. But there's there's often workarounds to make sure that we can keep that accessible, so. And uh, what, what about, uh, you know, students have backpacks and coats and so forth at kindergarten through fourth, uh, where, where do they put them when they come to class? Well, I know the guideline in general is encouraging students to keep those things near their desks so we don't create these potential contact points in the classroom where people, where the kids are gathering to pick up their stuff. So um, in general, as you review the, the guidelines that we put together, you're gonna to see that those, those possessions and those items are being encouraged to keep at the desk. Very good. Um, other common questions uh, with employees back and, and working is, uh, Becky's centered around a uh, colleague, you know, comes down in six, do other staff have to quarantine? Uh, how does that, that whole system work? So that's the, the job of the contact tracing that, that um, we are doing. Uh, and that is that we want to be very um, intentional and directed about 
how we would quarantine people. Um, so what the health department considers an exposure is being within six feet of somebody who is sick for 15 minutes or more. And so it's a bit of a puzzle to put that together. Um, at this point in time, with the limited amount of people we have in our buildings, we're not looking at building-wide quarantines. Um, and so we really, again, we want to keep people at work where possible, and we want to also keep people safe and healthy. And so, again, it's very directed how we, how we will do this, and we will work with people individually. Okay. And Nancy, the, the Safe Start uh, training modules that everyone is supposed to get done, um, uh, is there time today or tomorrow that I could do that? And how do I do it? I haven't done it yet. Well, we, um, we were hoping to actually be done a little early today to allow for staff to be able to take that training. Um, I would encourage staff to work with their supervisors uh, to ensure that that training is able to be completed um, by September 4th, which would be for tomorrow. Um, I also want to add that um, as you're taking the training at the very end, you'll be asked to verify completion of the training and um, you'll be asked for a class ID number and a um, class name, and both of them are just simple. It's COVID-19. You know, Nancy, I think we will try to finish up to this morning by 930, and we were supposed to go till 10, so that'll give everybody, you said it only takes about 20 minutes, it'll give everybody a mm -hmm. half hour, and they can finish up that training this morning. Fantastic. And where do they find it? If they go to the staff homepage, and then at the very bottom is headlines, and you'll see Safe Start COVID trainings. Okay. And you just have to click it and it takes you right in. Very good. Let's see other questions that are kind of common here. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, Nancy and her team plan to put together a Q&A from today uh, with answering quite a few of these questions. I see lots of questions about uh, when we're back in school and, um, what do we do with students uh, wearing face coverings? And what if uh, a student is sick and so forth? Is there gonna be any other training, Nancy, for when we're getting closer to coming back to school and maybe some of these questions that folks are asking we could get prepared for? Absolutely. Um, right now, um, we are preparing trainings that um, principals can use in their buildings when sharing with students. Um, so we want to make sure that our students uh, have an opportunity to watch all of the videos um, regarding social distancing, the hand washing, and, um, and then the facial coverings. And then we'll get more um, detailed oriented and working with our teaching and learning team to ensure that we have uh, proper protocols to follow regarding um, what does it look like to go through a hallway um, transition period. Um, what does it look like from, to move from small group to whole group instruction, um, et cetera. So we want to make sure that we're um, timely with our trainings and giving you the information that you need in order to be able to do that work with kids. And Becky, back to thermometers. Um, so staff supposed to take their own temps before school and, and uh, students, families are supposed to do the same thing. Uh, but what if, uh, you know, student shows up or a staff member shows up uh, and they haven't taken the health check app or haven't done it? Uh, do we have thermometers in schools to take folks temps? We do. Um, this summer, we actually beefed up our supply and um, these thermometers are very good. I know that across the district, we have a random selection of, of thermometers and not all of them work wonderfully. And so we did get a good supply of non-touch thermometers so that um, each building will have a couple of new thermometers and the high schools obviously um, will have more than that. And we will watch the need. If we need more, then we'll get more thermometers for the buildings. What about families out there, Becky, who may not have a thermometer? What do we do? And of course, we are going to have families who need that resource. And so a couple of things, um, something that uh, Oscar Harris can help us with and is reaching out to our community partners and, and uh, getting some donations of thermometers for our families in need. That would, that's one thing that we're looking at. Um, but also for, for those families, there's 
there is no shame in having us uh, do that health screening at the door. Um, and we definitely don't want it to uh, be prohibitive, you know, for families to send their kids to school. We'll get them taken care of and, and we'll get them into the classroom. And what about uh, if a staff member, when we're not in, doing in-person and uh, learning with students or instruction, but uh, teacher comes into school and they're going to work from their classroom and they bring their their own child, uh, is are they supposed to screen their child or how does that work? Um, yes. So, uh, um, and, and, and I will, I guess, defer to uh, Sabra around bringing kids to work, but um, you would want the students or the children to uh, be have the same health screenings and and follow the same health guidance when they're in our buildings. And did, did you say the students that are going to be in the day camps, uh, there's like 20 going to be at a school, will they have, have to do the screening before they come to day camp? Yep. Yes, they will. So working with Lisa White and Jason and Curry, um, they've been doing that all summer. And so they'll be continuing to do that as we start the fall. Bill, uh, questions about when, when are you going to be setting, uh, putting dots on desks and so forth at grades five through 12? When does that start? Well, some of it's already started. Um, the Secondaries are moving a little bit slower just because that's not going to take near the amount of work that the elementaries are, but the process has already started and uh, uh, I think a lot of the material is already at the sites. So if there's any questions on that specifically, again, feel free to reach out to me and we can uh, help you along in that. Also, uh, my, my classroom's already been set up. Uh, I'm a third grade teacher and my teacher's desk is not a very good spot to do uh, distance learning. I'm, I want to I want to come into my classroom and I want to conduct my cl classroom learning with my students and distant learning from my from my desk. Can I move my desk? Well, what's important is that we're maintaining the six foot social distancing, um, and that's why we're marking the floor so that we can reset these classrooms quickly um, when the time comes. So, if they want to make temporary modifications, adjustments to help them. Uh, work with this uh, virtual uh, program a little bit better, they are welcome to do that, just to make sure that they understand that we need to reset that room before students occupy it, so. Very good. Well, I think those are the kind of common questions, common questions about the Health Check app, common questions about temps, about training. Uh, so all of those, I think uh, we'll try to answer, but I think uh, probably the most important for today is we'll give you time if you haven't already to complete those four modules, right, Nancy? Are there four of them uh, that you can get done here this morning? By uh, we had scheduled this for a two-hour session, so we'll we'll uh, looks like we'll finish up early on that. And I just want to thank everybody for listening in. Know that there's more training that's going to be coming. Uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, or your building principal, who's the COVID supervisor. They can get those questions uh, to us as well. So with that, I think uh, we'll wrap things up today. I thank the panelists uh, for their participation. Uh, thank our interpreters uh, for working with us. And everybody have a great day. See you later. <laughs>